Hot. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for announcements today, there's only one. Yay! <laughs> Uh, the AGM meeting is on March 30th, which is in a few days. Thursday, not this Thursday, next Thursday. Yeah, next Thursday. Oh, it's a week from now. It's okay. And it's at 7, so be there. <laughs> um, the annual report is available on the old piano, and a digital copy can be emailed upon request. Asking you shall receive. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to pray now, so if you have any prayer requests, I will write them down and pray for them. Dr. Livingston's uh, son is healing after uh, getting hit by a bus. That's, it's a long journey. It's a big one. <coughs> senior high retreat this coming weekend at Eston, so prayer for safe travel for all the young people coming, mm -hmm. and that um, those who don't know Jesus would know Jesus, and that there would just be a refreshing and a filling for all that are attending and sustaining for the students as they're putting on that retreat. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to be awesome. <coughs> I pray for uh, Stephen Colleen Lee town here and lost their son three weeks ago in a car crash in Calgary on Deerfoot. They're back at the farm and uh, she's not taking it very well at this time. Stephen will be okay. I check in with her every three days just to make sure she's okay and talk. But uh, everybody's watching. We will pray for them. Anyone else? Mark and Larissa got married yesterday, so they're off, well, shortly we'll be off uh, heading honeymoon way, safety for them. Cynthia continues in our journey uh, with our daughter, uh, and she spent the last week in Calgary, she did pray for Samantha and yeah. I'll just leave the details for other people to ask you. Okay. Do you have any praise reports from the week? God did nothing this week? <laughs> Did you have cake? What kind of cake was it? That's true. I enjoyed it. Black Forest. Black Forest cake? Mm -hmm. I didn't get invited. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to thank God for all of the things that he's done, and then we will ask for him to come in these situations. So Jesus, we thank you that the snow is leaving, but it's still coming. But we thank you that it's going to go, and that spring is just on the edge of the horizon. And we thank you that... Even though winter has to come, spring will also come. And we thank you that you're faithful in all of those seasons. 
We thank you for Jason's birthday, that he gets to live another year, um, and just be able to breathe in the breath that you've given him. And we thank you for the blessings that you put in his life. We thank you for the blessing that he is to the people around him and his family. And we just pray that you would continue to bless him as he keeps breathing. Jesus, we also thank you for the Grand Prix that was on Wednesday, and we thank you for all the parents that came, and all the kids that came, and all the lovely cars that they made. And Jesus, we just pray that you would meet some of the parents who may not know you, and that they would come to know you, Jesus, and there would be salvation in their lives. And we thank you that Awana has been a program that opens up opportunity for people to come into the church. And we pray that you continue to bless them. Jesus, we just lift up to you Dr. Livingston's son, who got hit by a bus, and we ask that you would bring healing to his body, that he would be restored, so that he could um, be completely who you created him to be. And any pain that's in his body right now would go, and that he would feel healing, Jesus, and he would know that it's from you. <coughs> Jesus, we pray for senior high encounter that this is this weekend at Essen College, and we just pray that for the people traveling there, that they would be safe, the roads would be clear, they'd be able to see, and we pray that these kids would encounter salvation, and they would be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that the students would feel sustained through the whole weekend, Jesus. We pray that they wouldn't burn out, and that they would also be filled, along with the students. Jesus, we lift up Stephen Colley, who lost their son. And we thank you that just like the winter comes, it also has to leave. So we pray that you would help them mourn properly and lament. And we pray that there would be peace in their lives because of it. We thank you that you're speaking to them. And we thank you that there's people reaching out to them. Thank you that they're not alone. And we pray that you would just continue to heal their hearts as they walk through this time. We thank you for Mark and Larissa as they got married yesterday. And we just pray that you would bless them in their marriage and that they would stop texting Pete. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they would just enjoy what they have now and be present in the moment. We thank you that they get to be married. And we just pray that you would bless them in all that they do. And we also pray for Ron's daughter, Samantha, and we just pray for whatever's going on there, that um, she would be able to hear your voice, Jesus, and she would be redeemed. She would not think that she is ashamed or anything like that, Jesus, we just ask that you would restore her identity and that there would be freedom and breakthrough in her life. Jesus, we thank you for this church. Thank you that I get to be here and experience the best church. And we just pray that we thank you that you reign and we pray that you continue to reign in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Rachel. I like that you called it the best church. It means that you're learning and you're right. If anyone would like to correct her, please come talk to me afterwards so I can correct you. I want to invite the kids to come on up to the front. Come on right up here. Everybody. You're jumping over the lasers? I think that's wise. Yeah. There we go. Is this everybody? Oh, we got some more coming. Do you know what we're going to be doing today? I'm going to give you a bit of, uh, of uh, some homework to do on your way home today, okay? I know it's tough. But this is actually going to be harder on your parents than it is on you. Actually, that happens a lot with homework. 
come to think of it. So maybe this is just is par it, for the is course. It a car making contest? No, that was awesome homework. <laughs> that was what happened at Awana. But no, this is the homework. When you are driving home today, I want you to ask your mom and dad, what story did Pastor Peter tell today? And then they're going to tell you a story. And this is a story that's found in Scripture, okay? You can do this. They're going to tell you a story. It'll be cool. That's not like a laser beam test. Well, you can call it a laser beam story. All right, that's your homework. I'm going to pray for you now, and then we are going to send you with Mrs. Glass. And uh, we're going to head out this door right here. She, she made me promise not to preach too long today. So I'm going, to keep it, I'm going to keep it short. Okay, are you guys ready? Let's pray. Lord God, you have gifted us oh, richly with children. And we thank you for it. And so, Lord, make us wise. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we teach these kids. Let them hear your voice through our lips. Let them hear your truth. Let them come to you. Draw them in close. Make them mindful of your tone. And look to you in all things. Make us good parents and make us a good church in raising these kids. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys can head out. I like the pigtails. <laughs> well, I do welcome you all. And for those of you joining us from home, my name is Peter and I am the pastor here. I want to uh, give a special welcome to Norfolk County Seniors Home who are watching with us today. And uh, that's all the way in Ontario. We are glad that you are with us today and uh, we wish that you were here in our building, but we are thrilled to be able to come into your building. For everyone who is here today, man, you look good. Most of you? No, all of you. you. You look great. Jesus, who is perfect, and Jesus, who is the ultimate teacher, used story when he taught. He used fictional stories, stuff that he made up, not always, but often, and we call them parables, and he called them parables. And one of my favorite parables is one I'm going to lead you through today, and it is the parable of the prodigal son. And I think we have this picture that'll show up there in a minute. For those of you uh, who are too far away, this is one that hangs in my office uh, all the time, and I love this picture. Who, uh, who painted this? Seeger Coder. Seeger Coder painted this. Is he dead or alive? I think alive. Okay, Cedar, good work. I love this one. It's a picture of the prodigal son. When I was a child, I uh, identified with the son that's being hugged. I would do bad things, yell at my sister, go uh, steal their chocolatey bits. There was something about my sisters. They always had chocolate and they never ate it. Now, eventually, it would get thrown out because it would turn gray. But if I ate it, somehow that was wrong. I did not understand that. I don't understand it now. But I would go steal their chocolate and I would eat that. Or I would do little things. I would bug them. Anyone here have brothers? Aren't they just the worst? My sisters would agree with you. And I identified with the younger son. As time has gone on, I have begun to wonder if maybe I should identify a bit with the older son. And so we're going to work our way through this, and uh, we're going to discover in this story, somewhere in this story, you're going to encounter yourself. And I know this because that was Jesus' intention. And when he taught it, he covered the full spectrum. So let's see. Let's dive into this. The prodigal son. So the story goes, and we find this story. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. And I'm just going to tell the story. I invite you and I encourage you to go home and read this. Read, this, uh, read it again, especially if you know this one just about by heart. Read it again. 
Read it again. There is a father. This father is a wealthy father. This father has employees. This father has two sons. This father has a farm. And the youngest son comes to the father and says, I want what is rightfully mine. I want my inheritance. I want half of everything that you have. And I want it before you die. I want it right now. So the father gives the son half of what he has, and the son goes off, and Jesus teaches us, the son spends all of it on wild living. Jesus says he spends it on wild living. Ron, how did he spend it? Wild living. Lee, how did he spend it? Okay, hold on to that. That's coming back. He spends it on wild living. And he spends all of it till there is not a penny left. It's all gone. As soon as that happens, a great drought hits the whole area. Those with money have food. Those without money have hunger. He has no money. Because he has spent all of his money how? About a C grade there. Let's up it a bit. How did he spend his money? There you go. So he goes to another farmer. This farmer has pigs. Now when Jesus is telling this story, the people he is telling this story to are people who are educated in the Old Testament. People who are educated, they would call it the Torah. And they will hear pigs a little differently than we hear pigs. When I hear pigs, I hear bacon. I hear ham. I hear pork chops, pulled pork. Good things come from pigs. That's not what they hear. They hear this is the lowest of the lowest of the low. Jesus knew that. He's the perfect teacher. He knew that, and he used that animal on purpose. He could have said beef, I think good stuff comes from beef. I think steak comes from beef. I think roast comes from beef. Jesus knew that, but he used pigs. And if you're Jewish, ooh, that means something to you. So this son goes to a farmer that has pigs, and he ends up getting a job with the farmer in a time of drought. And the son sits there and he watches the pigs eat what people won't eat even in times of drought. This is the meagerest stuff. It's just not edible. The Bible calls it pods. It's the leftovers after you've eaten the food. This is what's left over. Give it to the filthy pigs. The young son sees this. And he is so hungry, he becomes jealous of the pigs. What's the the lowest job on the farm? I, I tried to figure this out. I think it might be mucking out stalls. Is that the lowest job? No farmers in here are going to answer this, eh? When I did harvest, it was sweeping out the grain bins. That was the lowest job. It was not air conditioned. You had to wear a mask, and then when you're done, you had to Dirt all around your face. Is that the lowest job? Robin, help me out here. Sweeping the bins? <laughs> Today it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. This guy is metaphorically sweeping the bins. And he's sitting there, starving, with nothing. He was wealthy. And he realizes something. He realizes that on his father's farm. The employees eat until they're full, and then they take the rest of what they haven't eaten, they put it in the sour cream container with the mismatched lid, and they slide it into the refrigerator for lunch tomorrow. That's what the employees get. Now the youngest son, he has already taken everything that is his. He has taken it all and he has spent it. How? 
I love interactive Sundays. But he knows if he is going to survive and if he's going to eat, he needs to go beg upon his father what he has no right to beg. And so he begins a very humble journey home. I wonder if on the way home he rehearses what he's going to say. I would. I would try to wordcraft that somehow. So off he goes home. When he's a long ways off, when he's way off, the father sees him coming. Can I ask you a question? Why does the father see him coming? Say it much louder, please. Because he's standing there watching, hoping he'll catch a glimpse of his boy. Just standing there, watching. You guys go do the farm things. I'm watching for my boy. And when the boy is a long way off, the father sees him. And he runs to the son. And he embraces the son. And the son says to the father, Father, I have no business being here. There is no reason for me to be here. You should be offended because I have caused offense. I knew it when I was doing it. I said, I'll take what's mine and I'll leave you. You I don't want. Just your stuff. Just your bank account just what's mine. And I went and I spent it. How? The father has no time for what the son is saying. He is too busy picking his boy up in the air, the arms of a working man, pulling him in close, trying to gasp words out through sobs. My boy is home. My boy is home. Turns around, looks at one of his employees and says, go get my boy some clothes. The clothes that he's wearing are worn out. They're not fitting for my boy. Go get him some clothes. Go get him some sandals. Put those sandals on his feet. Go get him the family crest. Slide that ring on his finger. That's how you know who's my son. Go get it. As the boy cries and says, Dad, I'm just asking for a job. Just let me be an employee, please. I'm hungry. And the father turns around and looks at a servant and says, Go get the cow named Steak. Kill it. Cut it up. Put it on the smoker, low and slow. Get your party shoes on. Get music. Somebody go find Jer. Get her decorating. We're about to have a party. You're invited, oh, but you are also required. You're coming. And there's this whirlwind of joy. There's this whirlwind of party. There's this whirlwind of music. There's light. There's joy. And a long way off is another boy. He has a name. We're going to call him... Christian, or Israel, if you prefer. And he's off working. That's what good Christians do, don't they? He's off working. And he starts coming back and a ways off. He sees the light. He hears the party. Now, he's a good Christian, so let's not get too happy too soon. we got to make sure that the It's balanced. There's only time for joy when it's the appropriate time for joy. Most of the time, it's time to frown and be sad and this world, hell in a handbasket. And so he finds a servant. And he says, what's happening? That looks like joy down there. I'm very concerned. Very concerned. Just not sure that's Christian enough. And the employee looks at him and says, your brother is home. Your father 
cooked the fattened calf. It's a party. Well, as a good Israel, as a good Christian, we can't have that. No, 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 no. Not when there's so much opportunity for sadness. So down the brother goes. He's angry. He refuses to go in to enter into the joy. No, sir. My father will come see me. And the father who is celebrating the young son comes out to the older son and says, your brother is home. Come welcome him your brother he was lost he's found he's home and the older son says the older son says all these years i've slaved for you now that's some good christian speak i did the things and I didn't complain except for right now but before no when nobody was looking no complaining now I am but not then you never once I never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. You never gave me money for McDonald's even. Nothing. You did nothing. Although I slaved. I did everything. I did everything in secret. I did everything in quiet. I was up earlier than you. I stayed up later than you. I was out when it was colder. I was out when it was hotter. Yet, when this son of yours comes back, listen to these words, after squandering your money on prostitutes, what did this guy, what did the young son do? How did he spend his money? Did it say anything about prostitutes? No, it's okay. We can assume, can't we? We can assume, because we know such things, that squandering your money on wild living, as Jesus said, was actually spending your money having sex with prostitutes. Curious that Jesus didn't say that. He must have made a mistake. The older son slanders, smears, and gossips things he can't know. They didn't even have social media back then. Now, if they did, the father probably wasn't looking. But the son was. They didn't even have that. This is not what Jesus taught. And with Jesus, the ultimate teacher... The perfect teacher. If the young son had spent his money having sex with prostitutes, Jesus would have said that. He didn't. He did say he has spent all his money on wild living. The older son lies about the younger son, but don't worry, he's a Christian. We're allowed to do that. That's one of those sanctified sins. We can just fill in the blanks, can't we? We know. Like, we know. Surely it was on prostitutes, gambling, drugs, surely. Betcha he even sped. Might have even danced. We had a wedding yesterday. Mandy and I danced at it. It was fun watching people look at us. It's the pastor. He's dancing. It's okay, I heard he's leaving. It'll be okay. We fill in blanks, don't we? You're not supposed to laugh at I'm leaving. That's the sad part. (laughs) His father said to him, Look, dear son. Oh, there's still love there. You have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours, but literally everything I have because your brother took what is his and it's gone and it's spent and it's gone and literally everything. When I die, my shoes will go to you. Everything I have 
is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he's found. And sometimes the Christian heart twists. But I heard he spent the money on prostitutes. Don't you know what he did? Did, and I didn't do it. All these years I've slaved for you. You never even bought me McDonald's. God, what have you done for me? I'm going to make a suggestion here. I wonder if this parable is not nearly as much about the young son as it is about the older son. The reason that I say that is because who Jesus was talking to. Jesus was talking to people who knew better. Jesus was talking to people who, if he was talking to people today, they would literally be the people in the church. The people who got up on Sunday and came to the church. And he would give this parable and As he gives this parable, perhaps you, like me, think, I must be the young son. With all of my wild living, I've even danced. But when I take a step back, and I've looked at this picture hanging on my wall for years, I kind of wonder if I'm the older son. Refusing to come to the party. Refusing to enter into the good news where we will find joy, we will find a party where we will eat steak, where we will listen to music, where we will laugh, where we will tell stories, where we will stay up way later than we should. And be tired the next day. Celebrating that a sinner has come home. You don't understand, I can't do that because I have responsibility abilities tomorrow so i'm going to stop the celebration and i'm going to walk away from the joy and so i wonder which brother do i resonate with People were complaining that Jesus actually spent time with sinners. You've heard that story many times throughout Scripture. Jesus goes, Zacchaeus. He spends times, he spends time with sinners, goes to Zacchaeus' house, has red rose tea, a little bit of honey. You don't do that. That's the sinner. Tax collector, the worst of the worst. One step above a pig, but not a big step. Jesus was showing that the results of bringing sinners into our lives and homes is joy. Look at the face of the Father. As he embraces the sinner who spent his money on wild living, who then came home and the Father ran to him jumped over top of the gate, stumbling through the potholes, running. Can't even hear what the son is saying because of the blood rushing in the father's ears because his son has come home. Look at the joy. I'll bet you there's tears. If it's me, there's tears. And what Jesus is showing that inviting these peoples into our Homes results in joy. And what he is also teaching is it is not hard for us, especially those of us who have spent our lives trying to do it right, that when we see someone who does it wrong get the benefits of those who have done it right, our response is not joy. Our response is anger. There was a woman who um, spent all her money on wild living. 
And then she found out she had cancer. We didn't actually, uh, she didn't like the word cancer. So we said her check engine light came on. That was soothing to her. That's fine, I can do that. Her check engine light came on. And she went into the hospital. And she shrunk physically. She shrunk and she shrunk and she shrunk. And she called us at the church and she said, I need to be baptized. This woman would never get out of the bed again. And so we came over to the hospital and we took a large pitcher of water and we poured it on her. Now that's a problem. That's not how we baptize, is it? You have to stand in a trough filled with warm water with lights and camera. That's how you get baptized. Any other way doesn't count right? She was never going to be able to do that. And so we took a large pitcher of water and we poured it on her and she was baptized. And then within the next day, she passes away. And I'm standing at my house and a car pulls up. It's her brother. Her brother is a guy who has had some struggles in this world, spent a little bit of time in prison for theft, sort of got his life straight, has a wife, has some kids. There's tension in everyone's life. There's tension in his life. But he comes to the house and he stops the car. He won't get out of the car. He motions for me to come talk to him. So I'm standing beside the car and he's mad. And he says to me, I had to stop doing all of the fun things and my sister didn't stop doing any of them and now you're telling me she's in heaven? Oof. He did it right. For years he slaved for God, changed his behavior, put away things that were going to hurt him, embraced things that were going to love him, and now at the end you're telling me that the young sibling gets the same as I do? Don't you know what she did, pastor? Can't you get her to not be in heaven? That is beyond my reach, just so you know. That's a God thing. People were complaining that Jesus ate with sinners. There's two kinds of sin that are represented here in this story. The first is the sin of the younger son, the sins of the flesh, the wild living stuff. That's pretty easy for us to identify. We're pretty good at that. We can even fill in the blanks, can't we? I know that they did this. I'll just tell people that they did this. And the other one is the sin of the older person, sins of the spirit. This is an area where many, many, many Christians struggle, but this is the sin that we've sort of decided we're okay with. This is the sin that we go, yeah, you know, it's not so bad. At least I didn't spend my money on prostitutes. Sins of attitude. What's your attitude? Does it stink? That's sinful. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. No, I'm not going to do that. That's way too much like a party. Forget that noise. I've slaved for God. He never did a thing for me. Maybe you've heard that. Sin of pride, ooh, there's a sneaky one. Coming in, it's bragging, look at what I've done. Boast in the Lord. The sin of jealousy, that person get, gets accolades and I don't get any. All these years I've slaved for you. The sin of anger bubbles up inside of us that one is so personal to me just full transparency i was talking with i was talking with jer and she was talking about the change inside of her she's she shared some of that with us and i said to her i wish well i don't wish you could have known me when i was an angry person i'm glad that you didn't but i'm telling you i was and my wife was sitting beside me nodding i married an angry man but god has changed me he has forgiven me and he has changed me but i embraced the sin of anger Not righteous anger. Anger of, because you got accolades. Why didn't I? 
You got stuff. Why didn't I? Life's easy for you, but not for me. I had to work hard. Anger bubbles up. The sin of gossip, backbiting. The sin of rebellion. This rebellious spirit, oh, it bubbles out of me. Maybe you. Definitely me. These are sins that as Christians we often look at and go, ah, those are the good ones. But we know that God looks both at our outward appearance, that's the younger son, but also inwardly at the heart. We're so quick to condemn the younger brother, but Jesus is actually speaking to those who should know better, and we know that because of what we find in Luke chapter 14, verse 7. He's talking to those who should know better. In our series in James, we find ourselves in James chapter 4. We're at the end of chapter 4, where we find these words, and this is chapter 4, verse 11. It says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. That's the older son. Spend his money on prostitutes. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. The older son is judging the father. You went and hugged him. He was with pigs. It's not our job to judge others. And it is sin to gossip. It is sin to fill in the blanks. It is sin to bring their story to to people and smear their name. It is our job to obey God's law and not to judge whether it applies to you. Full transparency... Ah, from time to time, have thought the speed limit does not apply to me. I knew I was preaching this sermon. I had to drive to Saskatoon on Thursday. I did the speed limit, and I got passed by the RCMP. Yeah, I did. You guys are not cheering nearly loud enough, but I'm telling you. I don't know. Maybe that's been your sin. Maybe there's other things that can be your sin. Other stuff that's happened. I, I'm, I'm shocked at how easy it is to steal. I, that's, that's, I don't try to steal. I don't think about stealing. But isn't it interesting when that comes and presents itself where you could report that it's three when in fact it was five? Or I could just borrow something and take it home. I'm going to bring it back. But I don't. It's amazing how much that stuff comes I watched as people had stuff on their grocery cart and then they had a whole flat of something on the bottom and they didn't pick it up and put it on the cart and they just walked it right out of the store. And my sinful mind said, I could do that. They did it. I could do that. Food's expensive, you know. It's getting more expensive. And I begin to break God's law primarily because I'm judging whether or not it applies to me. Then there's the second part. This is starting in verse 13. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to finish. We're not there yet. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor or your brother? What right do you have? This is God's deal. Your deal is to follow God's law and come into the house and party joyfully. Here's the second part. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we will stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. What you ought to do is say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. 
Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. The question is, have you asked God? The first one sure seemed like it was aimed at the older brother. The second one sure seems like it's aimed at the younger brother. Did you ask? Did you ask God, do you want me to do this? Or did you just say, I'm going to do this? Have we included God in our day to day? Have we included God in our lives that we said, Lord, take our lives and make it yours? We've given our lives to you, God. Have we asked him what he would have us do? This is a uh, story that as I read the story and as I reflect on it, I think I'm both sons. Boy, I'm thankful for the embrace God gave to that young son came running to him because when I was far from him and I turned back around to come in shame to him, he met me with the ring with the family crest and said, this is my child. And when I have come to him sanctimonious and pious, he has greeted me and he has invited me into the party. There's steak. There's music. It's warm in here. There's people you love. Come in. Come in. Jesus is the ultimate teacher. And it's our job to learn. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back to the front. We're going to sing together. But I want you to reminisce. I want you to think about who, where did you find yourself in this story? What resonates with you? Or if, like me, you resonate in different parts of this story. I want you to bring those things to God. There might be some confession that needs to happen. Confess. And then let's sing. It'll sound like a party. You should come in. It's a good party. It's a happy party. Jesus is Lord. He is a good Father. Come on in. Lord, I am thankful that you run to us when we turn to you. Oh, it is humbling to realize that our way is not working. And as we start to turn to you, you lunge at us. You run. And Lord, as we walk home dirty from the fields, Something sounds just a little bit too much like joy. You guide us into joy. You welcome us into joy. You hear our complaints. You don't dismiss them, but you show us your way. And you welcome us to the table. And you place the family crest on our finger. You dress us and you shoe us and you feed us. And if we're not careful, you call joy out of us. And you also show us the joy of when people return to you and you invite us into that joy. Lord, make us like you. Change us. Thaw what is frozen. Rejuvenate what is dead. 
Lord, we are about to see grass grow again. We are about to see cedars in the fields. We are about to see food pop out of the ground. And we are about to see a bunch of people that need to turn to you. And sometimes, God, that happens when we walk by a mirror. Bring us to life again. Bring us to joy again. Give us this day our daily bread, whatever that may be. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Today, I will pray this blessing over you. This is from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 33. I invite you to... Put your hands out if you're willing. Receive a gift. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his glory and is intended for his glory, all glory to him forever. Amen. I invite you to come back next week. I will be in Ontario at my grandmother's 100th birthday party whether or not she is there. Ron will be preaching. He will be taking us in our next part of the book of James. And following him, Rachel's preaching. I'm excited about this, both of them. I invite you to come back to the best church. Someone said that once. Blessings, my friends. We will see you then.